entitled The Inheritance Part 3. <clears throat> First of all, Scripture in the last days divides into two revelation categories. One, the destructive events that take place on the earth, and the other, the activities of those taken in the rapture in the martyr groups. Scripture indicates the division starts with the sky signs. Turn to Luke, the 21st chapter, verse 11. A great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Beautiful sights, great signs, shall it be from heaven. Now turn to Matthew 24, verses 7 to 9. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, Actually, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now we find that the descending water is the same, Matthew 24, verses 79, as it is in Luke 21, verse 11, with the exception of the sky signs, which are not mentioned in, Luke, in uh, Matthew. What is mentioned in Matthew are the progression of all the other signs and ultimately the delivering up of these individuals at the beginning of sorrows. <clears throat> so there's a divergence as being that the sky signs are for those that are preparing to go. The absence of the sky sign delegate those that are going to be left behind. Why is it? The linchpin is in Luke 21st chapter. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. The sky signs are going to be understood by those that are prepared to go. They're not going to be understood by those that are going to be left behind. Those that are preparing to go will rejoice when they see the sky signs beginning to unfold. So we see the beginning of a division. Turn to Joel, the second chapter, verse 28 to 30. Second chapter, verse 28 to 30. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke. We find that the time of the sky signs will be the division into communities of the church, the great outpouring, the great 
revival that will raise up apostles and prophets that will shepherd the church. Sky signs are an indication of the progression, the turning around of this deteriorating condition that's in the church due to the terror factor. It's going to be the time, the harbinger of things that are going to lead into the, the rapture. That's why we're told to look up and rejoice because it's going to be understood. The Spirit will quicken us to understand that our change is very, very close. Principle. Glorification takes place instantly. Those who experience it are taken to the Father's throne. So we see the division, the sky signs. We see the end of the sky signs is the rapture. The rapture constitutes the instantaneous change from human to divine. Glorification takes place instantly. Those who experience it are taken to the Father's throne. So in the first Corinthians, the fifteenth chapter, verse fifty one and fifty two. this point on, of course, the separation is complete. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be change. So everything that's going to take place is going to culminate in the twinkling of an eye. It's the change. It's going to be the result of a series of changes. We see this illustrated symbolically in Revelation, the 12th chapter, verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. <clears throat> and the child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So we find that the birth, the symbolic change from human to divine, which happens instantaneously. Of course, <clears throat> the origin of the change is the spirit. The spirit that in each one of us is going to be the agent of change. Those that have prepared for that one instant will experience it. Those who haven't will miss it. It's going to be instantaneous. And it instantaneously <coughs> takes place and very quickly the individual there's no time that he remains after the changes. It's an instantaneous ascension away from the earth. To the throne of the Father. Principle, Scripture teaches the glorification process confers all crowns and position in majestic appearances of glory instantly to all. In other words, the change is not only from human to divine, the change is total in the position, the crowns, the degree of glory, the <coughs> essence and the quintessence of all the reward that's coming to that person takes place with the change. Turn to Revelation 22. Wow. 
And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. So when he descends, he's descending with his reward for each individual. <clears throat> when he speaks and the spirit changes, the reward also comes instantaneously with the change. So then we'll appear in the image of Christ with the crowns, with the glory, and with the physician, all given instantaneously. Turn to Romans 8, verse 17. And if children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Everybody receives the glory instantaneously. Everybody receives the reward instantaneously as a group. Second Timothy, fourth chapter, verse eight. Forth, it was laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing, and all get it simultaneously. So Paul's crown is with the Father. When the Lord descends, he descends with Paul's crown. And Paul, in a lower heaven, descends to earth to experience the change. Experience the change, he gets the crown, he gets the position, the, the throne position in everything simultaneously with all the others. They're all glorified together, all positionally uh, allocated together. What we are storing in heaven now, in the second inheritance, in other words, the inheritance with Christ, all that's taking place is being stored with Christ, with the Father, to be transported and incorporated into change. Scripture teaches the elect go directly to the thrones that have been predestined for them. Ephesians, second chapter verse 5 to 7. <clears throat> Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace you are saved. So what's being said here is that Father in eternity predestined the position, predestined the glorification of each individual, and made provision for that person in life. So that even when they were in sin, everything was still there for them with the Father <coughs> from eternity. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When the Father predestined and called, and justified, and glorified. He did it all at one time. He allocated for that individual from eternity past his position, the crowns, the, the degree of authority, the degree of glory, and the place where that person would be seated when he achieved totality of perfection. 
verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So, what's being said here, in the heavens, or beyond the heavens, in the presence of the Father, are thrones already there. <coughs> Crowns already there. Each one has a position that's allocated strictly for them. Their rewards, their seated position, everything. At the time of the blood descent, at the time of the change, it all transfers to the person. And all that person has to do is rise to the place of his allocation and <coughs> take possession of what's his, what the Father has given him in the Son. Revelation, the fourth chapter, verse 4. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So what John is seeing is a church that's been raptured and in the position that the Father's allocated for them. There is no time in which they're going to be directed to go to anything they will know exactly where their individual position is and what it is. So when they reach that stage, when they reach that point, they just sit down in the throne and begin to <coughs> become incorporated as a permanency in the divine order of things. Revelation 5, verses 8 to 10. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the land. So this is the only group that's there, the elders and the four living creatures having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. So the duties, the, the duties that they have at the throne is to be custodians over the prayers of those that are still on earth. The prayers come up, they are captured, allocated, to the elders who hold them until the specific time in which they will be released to the angels that will administer the pronunciation, the allocation of the prayer so that the Father will meet the needs of the individuals that are on earth. They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So we find that there are hundreds of thousands of them that have been taken out of every race, language, cultural group on the earth. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. So it's past tense. When they get there, that's what they have been. <coughs> uh, their position is already allocated <coughs> with, along with the authority to exercise it. Principal Revelation Mystery Scroll is not open until the rapture takes place. Revelation 5, verses 1.
And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. So what we find here, four horsemen of the apocalypse, the symbolic representation of all that is incorporated in the seals do not happen on the earth until after the rapture. The Lord is become the inheritor of all things by the Father. The Britannicus group shared in that so they are not going to take place until the elite group is seated around the throne. And opening the opening of the seals is part of their inheritance. The Father will hold it all back until they are assembled in the place that He has allocated for them. Then the mysteries will begin to unfold, dealing with the tribulation. Next week, and try to go into them and uh, get an uh, understanding as much as possible. Title The Place of Works. Principle Scripture teaches after salvation enters the life, works will determine the saint's place in eternity. Turn to Revelation 14, verse 13. <coughs> Revelation 14, verse 13. And I heard a verse, voice in heaven sing unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest <coughs> from their labors, and their works do follow them. <coughs> the works that we do here Determine what position we're going to have in eternity. The works that we do here will always be with us in eternity. Scripture teaches that God has ordained the works that each one is to perform in life. Isaiah 26, verse 12. Isaiah 26, verse 12. <clears throat> Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, but thou hast wrought all our works in us. The word wrought there is ordained. Okay, for you have also done all our works in us, is my point when it says done, I guess. And then you got wrought, and it means. That means God has designed the works that we are to do in this life. Right. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 
Chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So what's being said here is that God has ordained the works that we are to do in our life. He specifically designed and crafted each one to bring forth specific work to his honor and glory. Turn to John, the ninth chapter, verse 3 to 4. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. It's coming a time when we can no longer will no longer be able to do works <clears throat> because of the darkness that will engulf the earth. So what we're seeing here is that each individual is called and crafted by God to bring forth a specific work. Philippians, third chapter. Philippians 3, verses 12 to 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So he's illustrating a principle here. That Something's wrong with it. Yeah, uh, you got Philippians. Uh, he read something else. Oh wait, wait, it's Philippians the second chapter. But at the <laughs> top of my, at the top of my Bible, it's Philippians the third chapter. But the third chapter, don't pick up until the half of the day. I, I, I believe you, but I do yeah, think you read from somebody problem, else. Yeah. Philippians okay. the second chapter, chapter. Uh, twelve and thirteen. Twelve and thirteen. Yeah, okay. love it when that happens. Yeah. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Which brings us to <coughs> the understanding of this business of works. The works that we are designed to do aren't to be done by us, but to be done by God. It's God working in us, using us to bring forth the result. That's what Jesus was consistently saying. It's not I to do the works of the Father in me. The same thing is true with us. We have been brought forth to manifest specific works. Each life is designed to manifest a specific work in that life. <clears throat> we are the vessels. We do the... Uh, the Yielding and God working through us, directing us, brings about the result. Turn to 1 Corinthians, 2nd chapter. Excuse me, 
begin. First Corinthians, the third chapter. <laughs> the page is the second chapter, but the scripture is over in the next passage. First Corinthians, the third chapter. First Corinthians, the third chapter, verses five down to verse nine. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you receive, by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So that neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. In other words, they're in unity. Every man will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For your labor is together with God, your God's husbandry, your God's building. Now this is a beautiful passage of Scripture that illustrates how the works come forth. God has crafted each one of us with a certain calling. <clears throat> That's our specific region, area that God wants us in, to operate in. And in that calling, we are given specific attributes, abilities. And in that particular capacity, as we yield to God, God brings situations into our life where we can manifest those attributes. And when we manifest those attributes and we allow God to work through us, directing us, then we do the labor when it's God that brings forth the finished result. You witness to somebody. God basically uh, uh, led you in a situation where that experience would take place. You yielded. You spoke. You chose the words. And God finished by ena enabling the person to receive. So he says, so what he's talking about, we are laborers we're together with God. He's in us, working through us, but he's also in the situation, working it to a conclusion. Now, if we don't yield to God, then, of course, the work will never develop. So what Paul is saying here, that we have, a, we have a, 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 a job to do, we have a part to play, and God has a part to play. And when we do our part, God does His part, and the end result is He gets glorified. Beautiful situation. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, let's go on. <clears throat> Scripture teaches those who have allowed the works of God to manifest through them in the world will receive rewards. <clears throat> We're in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. Just drop down to verses 13 to 15. Every man's work shall be made manifest. But they shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. The fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he shall which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. Now Paul is talking about a situation here in which you have a mixture of God working being allowed to to work in the life to bring about a result and the person taking the lead in doing what they predispose they desire to do. <clears throat> this is illustrating a principle in our life. God crafted us for a specific work but we have to yield to what God's intents and purposes are. We can choose to not respond in respect and live a life in which we bring forth our own works. And in that respect, 
we will come up short. Now, this whole business of works is very fine-tuned by God. And it, 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 it basically refers to works that are acceptable to God and works that are not acceptable to God. And the works that are not acceptable to God do not endure into eternity. They will basically end here in this life. <clears throat> the works that endure to eternity are the works that stand the test of fire and will be rewarded for those works. The works that burn up <clears throat> just leave the faith foundation and all that is that the person will enter into eternity saved but he'll have no works, no position, nothing to show for his life in Christ. This is basically what Paul's talking about. And it's interesting because to determine a work that's going to endure, we have to understand the position that we are in in Christ. An enduring work is a work which is a response to the leading of the Holy Spirit in our life. If we're doing a work in which we have head knowledge only, and it seems good, it won't stand the test because it will be a work of carnality. Uncommitted Christians, Christians that live carnally, do these kind of works. And they're building up no estates for themselves in heaven, no position for themselves whatsoever because their works are going to burn up in this life. <coughs> Committed Christians are open to the Holy Spirit's leading. So naturally, they're going to embark upon the works that will endure into eternity because they're led of God. It's a big difference that we need to understand in our life and always be aware of because the enemy uh, will, will is stock and trade is to send Christians on unfruitful works. Now, Scripture teaches that the works of unsaved the uh, uh, unsaved people, their works determine their place in eternity also. Turn to John, the 12th chapter, Gospel of John, 12th chapter, verses 4 to 6. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and had the bag, and bare what was put therein. So we find that Judas' works was that of a thief and a betrayer. Now, turn to Acts. First chapter, verse 24 to 25. First chapter, four to twenty-five, and they prayed to the disciples and said, "Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place." So it's talking about it, but Ephesus. He went to his own, there was a place reserved for him, which was the result of the things that he had done in life. 
the works that he performed, prepared a place for him in eternity. Scripture teaches the works of evil men are never forgotten by God. Amos, the eighth chapter, verses four to seven. Eighth chapter, verses four to seven. Hear this, O ye that wallow up, that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail. Saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy? the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes <clears throat> yea and sell the refuse of wheat so it's talking about those that spend their time concocting things in which <clears throat> they can profit at other people's expense verse 7 the Lord hath sworn by the excellency of Jacob surely I will never forget any of their works The scripture is saying that the works of evil men will reside in eternity. From Revelation, the 20th chapter. Twelve to thirteen. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Judged according to their works. The things that they did cause judgment to be rendered against them. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. <clears throat> People are storing up judgment by the things that they say and do. <coughs> and it's all recorded. Actually, it was recorded before they even did it. God knew what they were going to do. He recorded it before they did it. <coughs> and this life is when they actually carry out the doing of it. And in the great white throne judgment era, <coughs> they'll stand and be judged according to what they then nobody will be innocent. So basically, the scripture is telling us the works, their works determine where they will spend eternity. The degree of punishment they will suffer. The place reserved for them. It teaches good works outside of Christ is not acceptable to God. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. 